Welcome uh, to everybody. Welcome to this um, event entitled The Future of Art and Art and Activism. I'm um, Peggy McCracken. I'm director of the University of Michigan Institute for the Humanities, and it's um, my privilege to introduce our panelists today. Um, let me first, though, specify, you may have seen in the chat, um, closed captioning is enabled, so you um, can use that if you wish. Um, this event is organized as a conversation, so we'll start with a discussion among the panelists, which will last until about 5 p.m., and and then we'll turn to questions from the audience. So please use the chat function for any questions you have. And um, uh, you can put them in any time as the session's going on. And we'll end at, um, at 5.30. Um, today's event is the first in an annual series um, on art and activism organized by the Institute for the Humanities and um, supported by the Andrew Mellon Foundation. Our goal is to explore ways in which art and artists um, address social injustice and advocate for a more just world. Um, we want to highlight the unique ways um, in which art uh, participates in activism. And we're delighted to collaborate uh, this year with the University of Michigan's Arts Initiative in their Future of Art series. Um, uh, our collaboration um, in this event suggests or claims a future for art and activism. And it's a privilege to launch our art and activism series featuring members of the design team uh, that created the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers at the University of Virginia. Um, you've just seen images of the memorial if you were here a bit early and uh, you'll see them again. And I very much look forward to hearing what uh, the architects and artists on our panel will have to say about the design process. Um, Today's event, again, today's event is a conversation. Our colleague Kristen Haas will introduce and lead the discussion and we'll turn to questions from the audience. And um, then in, or in order to leave as much time as possible for discussion, I'm gonna offer very brief identifications of our panelists rather than comprehensive introductions um, uh, enumerating their many accomplishments. But in the chat, you'll find a web page link uh, um, or a link to a web page where you can read fuller uh, biographies of the panels. Um, so first, Mi Jin Yoon is Dean of Architecture, Art, and Planning at Cornell University and co-founder with Eric Howler of the design studio Howler and Yoon Architects. Um, Mabel Wilson is an architect and architectural historian who teaches at Columbia University. And I add, she was also a much beloved visiting fellow in our Institute for the Humanities in 2019. Eto Otitigbe is a polymedia artist whose interdisciplinary practice investigates the intersections of race, power, and technology. Uh, he teaches at Brooklyn College and serves as head of sculpture in the art department. Eric Howler teaches in the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. And as I mentioned earlier, he is co-founder with Mi Jin Yoon of the design studio Howler and Yoon Architecture. And our Michigan colleague, Kristen Haas, teaches in American culture, and she is faculty coordinator of the Michigan Humanities Collaboratory. She researches, among other things, monuments and memorial cultures. Um, and so I will hand things over to you, Kristen. Thank you, Peggy. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to everybody who's here. It's, um, it's really exciting to be here and to be able to have this conversation with these remarkable folks. So I'm going to start by talking about an image. And um, thank you. Uh, here we go. This is a photograph of the base of the Strom Thurmond Monument on the Capitol grounds in South Carolina. It's a useful place for us to start our conversation today because it evokes a compelling question about how artists and activists can reinscribe our shared public landscapes. More specifically, um, a question about how artists and activists can remake the racial logics that have so insistently defined our shared pub public landscapes across the United States. We're gonna be focused on the South today, but 
This is a story across the United States. Um, this is in large part, this question about how we can remake the landscape, how we can reinscribe it. The question before us today, as we talk to the team responsible for the remarkable memorial to enslaved laborers at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. As you look at this photograph before you, you see a very familiar form in which something is not quite right. And if you look down at the bottom, you can see that the word five is a mess, a rough disruption of the clean and controlled text. The engravers had the difficult task of turning a four into a five when Essie Mae Washington Williams asked the state of South Carolina to add her name to the monument. She was the mixed race daughter of Thurman and a young domestic in his parents' house named Carrie Butler. While he was alive, Thurman kept the fact of Washington Williams hidden. After his death, she came forward and asked the state to put her name on the monument. She asked to be put into the landscape. In fact, she put herself into the landscape, inserted herself into a vocabulary that was organized not only to exclude her, but to keep the idea of her, the possibility of her hidden. The jagged, messy, blurry five raises a question about how we can fit a careful, carefully repressed perspective into an existing landscape, an existing visual, architectural, and symbolic vocabulary. The five also demonstrates how powerful messing with those vocabularies can be. I, I, I think the effect of the messy five here is kind of stunning. This afternoon, I wanna ask our panelists to talk about the memorial to enslaved laborers in the context of art and activism. I wanna ask them to think about their work in the context of how we can continue to reimagine our collective commemorative landscapes. Washington Williams intervention was a great start, but our panelists have been able to do much more explicit work together, both about what is off in our landscape and how we might move forward to fix it. The Memorial to Enslaved Laborers, more than 4,000 of whom built and worked at the University of Virginia, was set in motion by a student group formed in a class taught by Frank Groups, Frank Dukes, excuse me, and for um, and all the students who are listening first, hello, thank you for being here. Very glad you're here. Um, but also I just wanna underscore this memorial that we're gonna hear about today started with students. It started with students who advocated for it, who imagined it, who pushed it, who dreamed it, and who made it happen. Eventually it was mandated in um, 2013 by the UVA President's Commission on Slavery and the University. In July of 2016, the university invited five architectural firms to submit responses to their RFP, to their call for proposals. The university asked, asked teams to design a memorial that would honor the contributions of ins the enslaved and help current and future generations understand the institution's history, that would publicly interpret and re-inscribe that history and enslaved people's life story back into the landscape that would serve as a physical reminder of this history and invite reflection upon its legacy and meaning. And finally, that would include a public engagement process with the Charlottesville community at large and with a descendants community. Um, no mean feat, any one of those things would be really difficult. Uh, we are going to open it up to our panelists and we're going to start with um, a walkthrough, a short walkthrough of the project with some more images and background from Mabel Wilson. Great. Um, good afternoon. Good morning if you're from elsewhere and also evening. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you, Peggy, for the invitation. Um, thank you, Kristen, for the introduction. And we're looking forward to the conversation. So in reflecting upon how Black history is American history, writer James Baldwin made the following sobering observation. He said, quote, I think one of the stumbling blocks is that the nature of the Black experience in this country does indicate something about the total American history which frightens Americans." End quote. To tell the history of the United States requires reckoning with hard truths, 
With those histories that have been silenced in the nation's archives and in the public spaces of our shared landscapes. What are the stories to be told of the estimated 4,000 men, women, and children who built, worked, and lived at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville from its founding in 1817 to the end of the Civil War that augured their emancipation? When it opened in 1826, and as envisioned by Thomas Jefferson, signer of the Declaration of Independence, second governor of Virginia, third president of the U.S., plantation owner and owner of 600 enslaved men, women, and children over the course of his life. UVA's 10 pavilions that he designed housed faculty and their families. Its lawn rooms boarded 125 white male students, and the verdant swath of the terrace lawn was crowned by the rotunda, the centerpiece of the ensemble that housed the library. What until re recently remained silent in the official historical narratives about the university's antebellum period was mention of the academical village's dependency on an equal number of roughly 150 at one time enslaved men, women, children, and enslaved community. So along with clearing and terracing the area known as the lawn, or felling trees and milling them into planks. It was mostly enslaved workers, many of them young boys, who did the black back-breaking labor of digging the clay, filling the moles, and firing the bricks for the estimated 1.2 million bricks for the rotunda. The fingerprints in the bricks, like those uh, seen in in the uh, uh, archive, uh, in in the rotunda, in the vitrines, have stories to tell. Our challenge as a design team was to make material speak and to develop methods to thoughtfully remember this community of friends, family, and fellow workers, to revive their humanity while never forgetting the dehumanizing violence of enslavement. Thank you. Um, thank you. And we, we um, those images are so rich. I'm very glad we have them in our heads as we start our conversation. And I'm gonna start with a series of questions for the panelists. The first one is for Eric and it, it returns to the pieces that I read from the call for proposals. You were asked to honor the contributions of the enslaved and help current future generations understand the institution's history, to make that history clear and to inscribe it in the landscape, to make a physical reminder, but also to speak to a legacy and to engage with the community. Um, this was an unusual call. I mean, all of that is unusual. And then on top of that, there was no site, no budget, um, no real models. Um, so it's remarkable that you were able to do <laughs> something, anything. Um, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you started and describe your collective process and how it developed across the arc of the project. Sure. Um... So um, Mabel, thanks for the introduction. It's so great to hear you sort of describe the, the whole the whole thing. It sounds very easy, almost effortless, but in fact, I think Chris, you're right. It was it wasn't uh, linear or directional. Um, I think we started as one does by by doing homework. Um, you know, the task was so grand and so large. Um, we put together a team, including Mabel and Frank and Greg and Eto, and we thought about it. You know, we did a lot of research even before we went for the interview. And I think, um, you know, as, as good students, as good teachers, you know, we have to prepare. Um, the, the topics were so interesting. And just sort of reflecting on that interview presentation that we did, um, we thought about the, you know, I think we had an image of Michelle Obama, you know, speaking at the DNC saying, every morning I wake up in a building built by slaves, you know, so that was in our minds. We were thinking about Black Lives Matter. We were thinking about the General Lee statue in Charlottesville. So these things were, were present. But I think the important thing to say is that we joined the process in 2016, but the process had been started five, five years before that, maybe more. So maybe seven years before that. Um, as was alluded to, um, students sort of raised this issue. Their dissatisfaction with the small plaque that was placed in the rotunda by the university, I think it was 2007, so the university acknowledged the enslaved, but it was acknowledged in a way that was insufficient. It was misplaced 
and it also referred back to Jefferson. So the insufficiency of that gesture sort of launched the kind of student movement, which I think is fascinating, uh, to sort of say, let's call more attention to this question. And through their efforts and their lobbying, uh, they got the administration to launch an official RFP. That's when we joined as a team. Um, but I think before you do anything, as an artist, as a designer, I think you better do some research, uh, know what the context is, the bigger context. Uh, and the more we learned, the more uh, interesting and complex it became. And then we started to realize as we worked on it that, that this was much bigger than simply a you know, design a memorial. This was a much bigger question and in a way, a kind of pioneering gesture. I think this is one of the first universities to acknowledge this history. Certainly there's many more and we expect more to come. Um, but just in terms of process, I think uh, starting to do the research, starting to put together a team that could address some of these, you know, large, difficult questions uh, and having a complex set of skills like Frank Dukes is a faculty member. He had also been the teacher of students who had started the MEL process. Uh, he's also a community. Um, he's part of the community as a UVA professor, and he had sort of been involved in many of the discussions around the, the General Lee statue and uh, connecting with the descendants. So we, uh, we weren't starting with a, with a kind of, um, with a blank slate, but I should also say that first we wanted to design a process, not to design a memorial or a thing. Uh, we thought, how can we put in place a process that will feel uh, sufficiently engaged, that will sort of talk to everybody uh, before we draw anything. Thank you. Um, and, and my next question is also about process. Um, and this one is for me, Jen. I um, would love to hear more about your experience with engaging with the community. Uh, you know, it was part of the mandate. Um, and I'm just would love to hear you talk a little bit about um, how it worked, how much time you had. I know that's always such a big concern. Um, what surprised you about your engagement with the community? And then I have two questions. Um, were you asked to represent things that you didn't want to represent by the community or were you asked to represent things that you didn't know how to represent by the community? Kristen, these are excellent and hard questions. So thank you for them. I, I think I first share that the engagement that our team did was, and you're only seeing four representatives of our team. There are so many more, not only uh, Frank Dukes and Greg Bleem, who aren't on this uh, Zoom call, but our own internal design teams and then the extended team. So I think what was fortunate about the engagement process is, as Eric shared, it had been already underway for many, many years. So starting 2008, the student voices were already part of the conversation. 2013, uh, the university, President Sullivan created the President's Commission uh, on Slavery and the university. So the faculty and leadership were already involved in engaging with students. I think the task of bringing in um, a local uh, community, especially when there are um, town and gown kind of challenges, and then also very, very importantly, the descendant community uh, into a process where it could truly become a evolving conversation and dialogue, I think, and scaling that, I think was the biggest, um, design challenge for the design of the process. And um, I think we learned a lot from Frank Dukes uh, who developed this idea of community ambassadors. So um, they would go out kind of in smaller groups one-on-one -on -one, uh, to talk to descendants, to local members of the community, to students, uh, student ambassadors as well. Um, so I think we looked at multiple ways to engage uh, the community from online surveys to um, 
you know, the typical community engagement meetings, and then also in smaller venues, going to schools, public schools, churches, uh, and Eto and Mabel, myself and Frank uh, shared a lot of that, and even alumni engagement. I think Mabel did one of the first meetings with Black alumni from UVA. And um, I think deeply listening and withholding ourselves from starting to design was one of the important parts of the engagement process. So we, you know, about six months, six months, maybe even more. And if someone asks how long the engagement process was for this project, I would say it's, it took the full duration of the project, even under construction, there were conversations going on, changes that were being made as we listened and heard um, the communities. Um, you know, sense of discomfort around certain elements, which I can share later in the panel discussion. Um, but I think the engagement, I think the success, if there was a success of this project, is that engagement started before us, went through the whole design and construction process to after and has continued after us. Well, just to hear you say, you know, that the challenge was not to sort of rush in and design, but to really listen. We've probably all been involved in projects where that 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 wasn't the case, and you see it in the in the work that gets produced. Well, Kristen, maybe one thing I could add that not many people know is because there was no site. Part of the listening was we were doing uh, early sketches, but we weren't as a team trying to finalize. So the, the sketches were kind of prompts to gauge what felt to the community too big, too small, too ephemeral, too uh, monumental, you know. So part of that dialogue was giving them um, things to respond to in our searching for what would be the appropriate place and scale and qualities that the memorial needed to carry forward. And if, if I can just add maybe one 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 point um, to, to Mijin's, you know, excellent answer about our process is one of the things that we realized we had to sort of find um, uh, really to accommodate is, is the level of comfort uh, that the community felt in coming onto what's called the grounds, which is really the term for the campus. But UVA has a lot, I'm a UVA alum, so I, <laughs> you know, you get inculcated in all of these traditions. It's a very traditional school. And many of the, you know, particularly in the black communities just felt like this is not our home. And so it was also finding a place that felt comfortable for people to come and, and join with the UVA community. So, and as I understand it, you actually selected a site that is um, not, um, not, not as centrally located um, as you were originally thinking, but closer to a street where people from the community would feel more comfortable coming onto the grounds. Is that the case? Yeah. Um, so, so building on the the sort of thinking about engagement, this question is for Eto, and I'm curious. I understand that people that you engage with in the community really wanted visual representation of enslaved people. Um, and I can only imagine how complicated that gets, right? Um, especially given the number of people, the limited information that we have about who these people were. Um, can you talk a little bit about the eyes of Isabel Gibbons and um, her role on the memorial and, and, and the extent to which um, she was a response to that request for representation and kind of how you all were thinking about that? Certainly. Um, I think that's a great question. And that's really the reason I was invited to the to join the memorial design team. I remember my first uh, visit to Charlottesville and participating in a, a open dialogue at the Jefferson School. And uh, there was really passionate uh, request from the community for visual representation, 
to find ways to depict triumph over despair, to think about how can we represent the lives of the people who were enslaved, what they did and, and how they did it, you know? Um, so, you know, it was really a massive challenge and you're right, we had limited information. We have, you know, fewer than 5,000 names of those uh, fewer than 5,000 names. We have only about uh, five uh, images of people who were enslaved at UVA. Um, so the question there is, who do we select? Is it a composite of all of them or perhaps just one of them? Um, Isabella Gibbons kind of became our choice for a lot of reasons. She really exemplified this um, idea of triumph over despair. She was around um, at UVA during the time of emancipation and she remained in Charlottesville to be an educator. Um, she actually, while she wasn't slave, she worked for uh, William Barton Rogers, who's the founder of MIT. So for me, this project has a lot of interesting personal connections, you know, um, it, it being an alum of MIT. And um, so I had the, also the opportunity to think about, um, in addition to who to represent on the memorial, what other information about uh, Charlottesville in the area could be, could sort of lend itself towards um, imagery on the memorial. So I had opportunities to uh, go around with Frank Dukes and visit different community members, members of the descendant community. Um, visited different plantations around Charlottesville. Um, one of the more striking experiences was in um, the Daughters of Zion Cemetery, where we had a chance to see different um, uh, grave markers, um, some carved roughly in stone, and some of them were represented in, in the slideshow along with the image of Isla Isabella Gibbons. And I just thought about the contrast of that along with the contrast of um, the images of trauma we've seen of enslaved people. So really finding a way to sort of kind of combine or really layer so many kind of uh, almost conflicting images into one composite was the challenge that I worked with members of the design team on, um, which included the Stone Fabricators, a Quora Stone Company, who are really excellent. Um, and we, they, we worked with them to even develop a bespoke software algorithm that could successfully combine, you know, this composite image and texture, which I think was really interesting. And um, I also think the idea of photographic representation for me was inspired by um, one of those early trips to Charlottesville at this Jefferson School where I learned about the um, Rufus Holsinger archives. Rufus Holsinger was a photographer who went to Charlottesville. I think he arrived there in the 1880s, stayed on for quite some time. And he documented um, hundreds of um, photos of African-Americans in Charlottesville, certainly a little bit after um, Isabella Gibbons. But um, the idea that um, now freed African-Americans were choosing to document themselves and their family and decide making the decision as to how they would be represented was something that really kind of inspired me um, in this process. And can I just ask a follow-up question for, for those of you who just saw the images and haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the space, um, on the exterior of the memorial, there are these eyes looking out. And, uh, are people wandering around to the, I mean, because the, the interior is such a draw and I imagine people come in and they wanna look at the names and they wanna touch the marks and they really, are people making their way around? Because I, those, those eyes kind of looking out from the memorial are so powerful and they're such a complicated, powerful twin to the marks and the names on the inside. Are people going there? Are they seeing the, the eyes? Are they interacting there? I believe they are. And I think that's one thing that's really interesting about the memorial is it's, it's a series of experiences, not necessarily a linear series of experiences. You certainly have the marks on the inside, the names, the timeline, the um, pathway heading north of stone. And also, of course, as you mentioned, the, the eyes on the exterior, which look out, they look out to campus towards University Ave. So they sort of play a role of um, having Isabella Gibbons being a watcher, also looking out 
the gaze directed outwards um, from campus, perhaps even inviting people in. So it's another way to come and experience the memorial. And I just think that the, the haptic um, connection people have, we saw someone uh, pointing at um, that new name that was inscribed on the memorial and people really have, are, are compelled to touch it and to sort of um, share a physical experience with the memorial. And so to me, I, I think of it as, you know, getting some sort of feedback or energy from our ancestors in a way. I also think as you approach um, from University Ave, the, that site was um, selected in terms of the area that uh, the Isabella's eyes would be um, because it's on people's approach. And I think it's pretty powerful if you know to look for it. And then the question is when, when people realize. So she's watching you and she's calling you and it um, it sort of, it can start the visitor's experience with a kind of sense of her power, which is mm -hmm. really oh, thrilling. Um, my next question follows kind of on this theme and, it, and, and it's for Mabel and it's a little, it's a little more about the specifics of the space, but thinking about working in such a specific freighted, um, beloved design aesthetic as the UVA campus must have presented challenges and opportunities. Um, how did the, I mean, you talked a little bit about the traditions of the place, but how did the actual architecture, the forms and all of the baggage that comes with them um, shape your thinking about what you might do there what other commemorative vocabularies were you thinking about engaging with? Um, the names on the memorial are so powerful. And, you know, I think something about some names being full names and some names being partial names and some people just getting a mark and some people just get the, the, the trade that they plied. Um, I think all of that, those things together are really powerful. Um, but they also evoke a war memorial. Um, and those war memorials are, um, you know, the names on the wall of the dead. That, that's a way of commemorating loss and sacrifice in a very different context. And I know you all were working really hard to think about how do you remember a life, a full, vivid, in the flesh, human story that you don't have access to. Um, and mess with the architecture of UVA and remember it in a way that acknowledges the the inherent difficulty of slavery. So that's a whole lot, but but it is a question essentially about how you nego negotiated all of the above. Yeah, I, I that's a really great question. And, um, you know, I, I, I think as Mijin um, mentioned earlier, I mean, it really was it was a design um, process that was really about a dialogue um, with the community and to try to figure out like what were the expectations, the needs, the things that people wanted or didn't want to see happen. We also kind of recognized there were maybe people who didn't want to talk to us, who didn't even think this was necessary. I mean, it was important to sort of feel, feel out that landscape and you know, try to understand what we were hearing from people before we designed. And then when we would start to design, we had we had no budget, it's kind of a dream, but also a nightmare. We had no site, kind of a dream, but the, you know, and, and as you know, as Mijin said, like testing out forms, context, scales, trying to figure out what would work, and then having this sort of ongoing dialogue. And when we found this triangular site, which on one hand is both central because it is part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site, it's adjacent to the rotund, you know, so it's it's very it's significant, but but it's also kind of at a liminal space, at a border between the university and the community. And it, it just sort of locked in. And then having that geometry, the circular form, um, you know, also eventually just kind of locked in. And then we started to realize, oh, we could make it the diameter of the road. Down. I mean, like we started to kind of find connections to the to landscape and using Virginia Mist, which Mijin and Eric had used on another project, which is quarried locally, but also happens to have been used, you know, on the paving of the road. So it was sort of drawing in almost opportunistically things that we were discovering as we were going out and, and speaking with people. 
The second question about the names and the history, it, it was a difficult one. Like one, one of the things that we heard and we were, we were really tasked with, I think, was that we were asked to humanize or rehumanize, as someone told me, this enslaved community, you know, to give them dignity, to, 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 to try to understand like how one would live under that condition that there can be joy and laughter and family and friendship. Uh, and aspirations, but also loss and pain, and to show the violence, to not, um, you know, uh, uh, remove the sort of violence that's absolutely necessary to bring someone into that condition of being enslaved. And so working within that duality was a central part of that. And, you know, when we got into the archives, you know, the history and also of w what little UVA, you know, was starting to unearth, the historians and the archaeologists and finding that they didn't know the exact number. They estimate it's 4,000. And then we have about a thousand references of which 500 have names, but most of those are first names. So when you go through the archive, you see Sam in 1822, Sam in 1826, and then Sam again in 1846. Is that the same person? Sometimes there's young Sam. Oh, you, you know, it's, it's hard to know and also try to flesh out these relationships. So we just simply said, okay, well, we know there were mothers and daughters and sons and cousins and friends. Can we put that on the wall? Um, how do we speak to what they did? That they were, they were servants and they were laundresses and cooks and there's one fiddler on the wall uh, because there must have been music. And in fact, there's a record with it that said there was. So it was trying to take that archive that when, you know, was an archive of violence, you know, that kind of erasure, right? Essie May's erasure, as you spoke of, was was central to the creation of the archive of slavery at UVA because it was log records of, you know, renting someone for a week or renting someone for a year or the purchasing of the enslaved at Monticello by the professors, you know, kind of watching this this trade in human flesh. And so it was also very painful to even enter into to, to that archive. And I, I think just looking at the images, the the you know in a in a war memorial, the names are all different, but they're they are also they are all ta they are all identified in the same way and they are all listed um for the one thing that they that they did that got them up there and there's a way in which the combination of kinds of markings that people get on the memorial does you know it starts to give you uh, e even the difference between sort of sun and builder uh, starts to flesh something out in a way and i think we're going to see more of this. I know there are some projects out there right now that are, I don't know, they, they sort of have a Bridgerton vibe, like, uh, you know, like trying to invent people from the past that, that, um, that we don't have enough about information. We don't have their stories fully fleshed out and we don't want to, um, we don't want to get uh, go down that road. So I, I think this is, I mean, I, I, I suspect we're going to get some more questions about this um, challenge, um, especially the challenge of um, how do you represent a whole person in this context, which I guess is ultimately impossible. But you sort of, you all seem to have tried to build layers of context um, to work with layers of context around the place, layers of context around what you know about the individuals. Can I share, Mabel, like the moment you um, kind of like, like my mind exploded when you shared that uh, when we were in the design process that, you know, I always thought like historians, like accuracy, high fidelity to, you know, the archive itself. And you shared, well, the absences in the archive are their own sense of violence, right? And I think understanding that and then your, um, notion of the wall as this kind of genealogical cloud that it didn't have to have like a precision and an equalness in terms of the names and then that extended through even the lengths of the markings there are many different lengths of the markings on the wall to take on as new names are discovered short names long names um full names or 
relationships or skills, etc. So we're going to have a few more questions and then we're going to run the images again just to give everybody who's joining us a sense of um, what it looks like and what it feels like and and then we'll start taking questions from um, the folks who are joining us here today. Um, sort of building on that last comment, the idea of the genealogical cl cloud is very powerful. Um, and this is a question for um, me, Jen. I'm, I, I wonder how much, I mean, I, this is a question about lessons learned. You know, what are the lessons learned? What do you have to offer for activists? Um, but I wanna ask it in the, and artists who wanna transform their landscapes. Um, I'm, I'm interested to hear you talk a little bit about how much you've thought about beauty and the problem of beauty, because this looks like such a beautiful space. Um, and so this is a, a line of questioning that slightly contradicts the line of questioning that I had with Mabel. I was sort of saying, you know, how do you get the full person and how do you, how do you not have it be like a war memorial, which is only about a death? Um, but I'm, but I would love to hear you think a little bit aloud, a little bit about how you thought about beauty and beauty as a, um, I don't know, as a solution to the problem, perhaps of um, representing a life that you know to have been difficult, um, but also not only defined by the institution of slavery. I'm just wondering, if there's something to say about that. You're giving me very hard questions. I'm sorry. Um, no, they're good. Because um, we don't talk about beauty, right? Um, we don't talk about beauty, in, at least in the architecture discipline directly. Um, and I guess I would share that, you know, this team, like we, I think we all learned a lot from each other on our design team. And when I, um, in the beginning of the project and the process, and you know, especially some of the engagement meetings, very hard not to cry or um, be angered or like seeing images feel like viscerally, you know, um, you know, horrified. And I think that if um, all the conversations didn't happen. I would have thought that the memorial was about representing this horror and pain and violence. But in the conversations, as Mabel already shared and suggested, there was a real desire to um, bring humanity, dignity. And then Mabel used this word joy in one of our um, meetings uh, with the commission. And I, it just changed the nature of the conversation. And I think that um, we were all working really hard to find a way to create a space that felt like it had grace um, to it and something that wasn't overly heavy handed, even though it is made out of stone. And I think the multiple layers and kinds of spaces and the ways you can or can choose not to um, uh, engage the memorial was part of that kind of delicate, uh, subtle positioning and form making and knowing when to, when to step back. And that came out of a lot of the conversations. I don't know if Eto, Mabel, Eric, you have thoughts that you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I would just quickly just say, um, yeah, I mean, there were moments where you felt gut punched, like you just, you know, I remember there was a, we, we had gone out to breakfast before one of our meetings and Lewis Nelson, who's, you know, an architectural historian, amazing architectural historian and on the PCSU and was just a, a really great advocate for the project was telling us about the site of the um, anatomical theater, which was a building that Jefferson had designed. It was built and it's the only one of the ensemble of buildings that has been torn down. It was torn down in the 30s. And the fact that many of the corpses that the students had used to study anatomy, to really learn medicine had been robbed 
um, from the mm. graves of enslaved people, uh, often dug up by enslaved people who were then paid to, to, and it was, for me, it was a sense of, geez, I mean, exacting value of someone even out of their corpse. It was just like, that is the unending theft, right? You know, of that sort of logic. And I don't know, I mean, it was just, I don't know, it just, I just went, <sighs> When I when I when I when I heard that, um, and so it it was difficult. Um, but I do think that the other really strong point, and and this will actually connect to Eric, is that Eric brought up very early on. I remember in our first presentation for the RFP, like linking it to Black Lives Matter. Like this isn't over. Like what we are wit what we we're witnessing. You know that that legacy, right? To to realize there are going to be names added, the timeline should be amended. Like this is connected to where we are now, and that Frank Dukes had worked with a group called You Care, you know, that was was talking about like fair wages and access to housing, which are issues when you have, as you know, in Ann Arbor, a big university that's very good at driving up the price of everything, right? Which then produces these structural inequalities, and I think that was also something that kept the project not in this abstract past, but like recognizing and reckoning with the now as well. I think for me, um, it was, I had a lot of very personal um, interactions with uh, different community members along the way, uh, conversations with members from the descendant community um, that really made me feel like, okay, I'm getting closer and closer to understanding um, what this needs to be and, and how to go about doing it. Um, even uh, having a phone call with one of the descendants of Isabella Gibbons um, was a really moving moment. Um, and it always reminded me that, okay, we're working with people's family histories. And um, so it is a very humbling um, experience to be entrusted with that duty. Eric, did you want to jump in? You look like no, no. These were such great comments. I, you know, in a way, sort of talking this through with everybody, um, sort of brings a lot of that back. You know, the, the process and the difficulty. Um, you know, the word beauty is is tough because um, it's it's such a hard history. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think um, the memorial has different aspects. You know, I think we talked about the kind of roughness and the kind of the gritty kind of. Um, the exterior is, is almost like it's been broken out of a mountain. You know, the face, the, the stone is rough and it looks like it's been cleft um, and the interior is smooth. So it has those kind of dualities built into it. And I think as designers, we can sort of, in a way, think about different kinds of experiences, different kinds of interpretations. And I think it's important to leave those to some extent open-ended, to leave them open to interpretation uh, and to multiple visits. You know, the fact that the eyes are not visible all the time you know, you might see them one day and not see them the next day. And I think that's beautiful. It asks us to look more carefully. It doesn't just sort of broadcast a kind of billboard sign. It's saying, look and look carefully and look more, you know, look more carefully. So I, I love that about it. Um, I think the experience is also quite, um, quite carefully in a way choreographed that you enter with the memorial way below your, below your knees, you know, at the entry point. It's very easy to enter. It's not intimidating. But as you start walking very quickly, the horizon comes right up around you. And before you know it, you're inside of it. And it, and it blots out the city, it blots out the university, it blots out the rotunda. And so sort of conceptualizing a kind of experience of embedding yourself in the ground. I think that's, that's really, um, I, I hope you all go visit because it actually, it actually does what we had hoped it would do, which is it, it turns you inward. You know, whereas outside you're on the sidewalk, there's people, there's people laughing and talking. You get in there and, and it just focuses your attention inward uh, and, and downward to the text and outward on the wall. So the, the kind of geometry produces those sort of, in a way, bodily postures. I watch people, their heads are, are bent because they're reading the timeline because it's down low. Um, and I didn't realize that, but you know, we talk about the, the Japanese tea house that, that encourages you to sort of lower your head as you enter the kind of low threshold of the door it creates a kind of body response that in a way positions you in a way to, to take in um, or to, to interact with the memorial. So um, I can't say that all that was sort of designed, but 
some of those things were thought about um, and it's produced those effects and I watch people interacting with it and and it is um, it is a, it is powerful in that it does produce those behaviors and those um, those responses so uh, and you're nicely anticipating my next question which is for Mabel, which is about how the community has responded, um, how people are using it, who is using it, what you know about that. Um, I have the question because this is a particular interest to me, are people leaving things? Has anybody left anything? What will happen if somebody left something? Um, one of the images that you showed was is just an incredibly moving image of people in scrubs on their knees at the site um, which seems like an explosion of possible things happening there. But can you share some of what you know about how people are responding? Um, sure. Um, the, I mean, the response has really been extraordinary, um, especially given, you know, we had planned to have a dedication service uh, or uh, uh, ceremony in uh, April, but of course, you know, the pan pandemic made that impossible. Um, and so the site, um, you know, was sort of behind a fence because the sod hadn't been put down. And, you know, they put the sod down and took off the fence in June. And then literally once the fence came down, like right away, there was a group, um, this was shortly after George Floyd had been murdered, a group called White Coats for Black Lives, you know, had a kind of, a, my understanding, they had a small, Kind of gathering and then the next day there was this huge hundreds of of faculty students from the medical uva medical school did a you know a kind of um a remembrance uh where they were on on a knee for eight minutes and 40 seconds in remembrance of floyd um and i don't know i mean it was that kind of at that moment it was like that is exactly the pro you know that it links with what's happening now it links with you know um you know people's lives um in this contemporary moment and that was quite powerful and there has been the formation of a descendant group um that you know there was a small contingent that the university kind of knew of and, and this was primarily because there's a very strong descendant group both at monticello and at montpellier which is um James Madison's home, uh, somewhat north. Uh, and all of those, they're all, you know, because they've been in the area for so long, they're all somewhat related to many people in Charlottesville. So there, there was that, but there was none that had really attached itself for the university because of just kind of long-standing suspicious and distrust that the university never follows through on anything. So it's been very heartening to see a descendant community sort of emerge um, out of, you know, this longer process, not just as Mijin pointed out, not just our part, in, but, but a much longer process where buildings are now being named and the descendant group is formally organized. And, um, you know, there's the anticipation that as more people come forward, there are more names that are going to be added to the memorial. And I did get to ask you this question before, but just for people who were uh, listening, the, the design of the memorial did anticipate that more names would come up and so that the SMA Washington Williams problem of having to re-inscribe something that was intended to be shut down was not a problem. It was something that you had anticipated and you designed it as a um, open space to continue to take more names. Yeah, that's correct. Um, during the construction process, there were a number of names discovered in the archives, which was um, incredible. I think the work of the historians is never celebrated enough in their contributions to both the timeline and um, the names. And then, um, and then very, very recently, actually just weeks ago, uh, an additional five names were added to the memorial, which were discovered um, through both a combination of genealogical research and then DNA testing, right? So really using the um, everything from history to contemporary science. And so those were recently inscribed. And we wanted the memorial, even though we know it's out of stone, to be a, a place that's open and um, additive and uh, can change over time. Um, so, 
And and on, on to the question of things. Nobody's left anything. No offerings at this site so far. Mabel, do you remember that day we were there together? There was someone, and was it flowers in the flowers, yeah. jars that they were bringing to the site? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure people have. I don't know what's happening with those things, but I, I would suspect people are leaving things there. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly that's a sign of. I mean, and the the white coats for black lives, the the fact that people are engaging with it with this kind of intensity before we're out of the pandemic and that, you know, speaks to the power of the work that you've done together. Um, before we go uh, to questions and we're gonna show the images once again, and then we're gonna um, take questions from folks who are joining us. Um, is there anything else to say about you were doing this in a moment where there was a big conversation about memorials um, coming down and memorials being pulled off and hid in um, storage areas of museums? Were you were you engaging with? I mean, it's a that was a conversation about um, very particular kind of dangerous memory of the the war and white supremacy. Um, and you were trying to do something different in so many um, ways, but were you were you thinking about that conversation? Was it moving your thinking? Um, what, was it shaping the project? Yeah, I, I, others can add, but I think it was always present because of the Unite the Right. Um, um, yeah, gathering and the least statue and from the very beginning of our design process you know we knew this memorial was going up as as we everybody was deliberating taking monuments down and then literally as the memorial opened i think that's when we started to see the removal of the monuments in richard maybe maybe an anecdote which is okay to share um our, our design team worked with the construction team very closely. Cora Stone helped us develop the techniques. Uh, Cora Stone also installed the stone. They were hired by the general contractor, Team Henry, which was a kind of African-American owned small business from Richmond. Um, as the memorial was being constructed, the discussion about the monuments being taken down was ongoing. And <laughs> I've got a ballerina here ready for, um, for her ballet uh, rehearsal. Um, I'll finish my story. Please, please. So um, the governor of Virginia called Devon Henry and said, um, you can put up stone. Can you take stone down? And he said, sure, I can. So the same team that installed the memorial stone uh, also took down the monuments in, in Richmond, which is, you know, it's not a it's not a symmetry, but, it you know, it's it's a it's an interesting moment, you know, that, that certain values are being sort of reinforced and other ones are being um, taken down. Let me, uh, let me attend to this, uh, you guys. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think one of the interesting things, and, and one of you mentioned this about, about your project is you are, you're kind of a first wave and what I think is gonna be a significant number of new projects and projects that follow you, you know, I think, Reinscribing the landscape is a little bit like building a Roman arch, and um, projects that follow you aren't going to have to try and do all of the things that you're trying to do. There will be a kind of new shorthand developed that people will be able to work with. But let's go back and can we can we see the images one more time as we turn to some questions from the audience, and we can just sort of let those scroll. They will have more um, resonance for um, for folks now that you have um, heard us talking about the space. This was the original um, gesture that was not satisfying to the students. Some early drawings. So I'll start with one of the questions and it, it is, um, is the memorial meant to recognize indigenous people's claim to the land on which the campus was built? Was that part of your conversation? Um, 
No, that was not part of the conversation, though I think that is a really important dimension. I believe this is the land of the Manahawk. Um, and, um, you know, that is, you know, along with the legacy of slavery in this country, that is the other, I would call, original sin of the nation, you know, is the theft of indigenous land, right? You know, to then call it ours, America. Um, and that is really, I think, important history that is really, um, you know, that really needs to be be told. And, need, and also, and it's interesting, I mean, to think, you know, and there's work being done about black studies and indigenous studies and, and, and the connectedness of that. Okay. Um, another question says, the, the question is, please talk about the connection between communal mourning and activism. That's big. You thought my questions were hard. <laughs> Please talk about the connection between communal mourning and activism. In creating this space, how did you think about bringing together the historical, emotional, symbolic, and ceremonial? I mean, we have talked about that to some degree, but this is a sort of more specific question about mourning um, itself. Anybody game to take that one? Well, I, I think what we heard from the community, oh, this is the perfect image, Colleen and Datisa. Um, so during our meetings, what we heard was this need for the ritual and um, the idea of water being very, very important to the project as both cleansing and also symbolic. Um, and in the process of the design, there was a point in which, you know, things were over budget and one of the um, elements that, you know, was under consideration to uh, take out of the project was this, uh, the water element um, that uh, hovers over the timeline. And um, I think hearing the community's response um, to losing that element of the memorial was really powerful and it spoke to this need that the site was also a place to gather it's really about a space and a space where you could mourn and you could collectively mourn and um, I do think there are members of the descendant community which uh, believe that memorial is their memorial and it is their memorial. And to me, I, I just seeing Detisa and Colleen and a few others there, um, it's their space. And I think that's where they feel a connection um, to their ancestors and I don't know, I found it really, really moving to see how, yeah, you know, how different people um, inhabit the space and how long they stay at the space. And I think it differs by your connection. Uh, the Tisa, sorry, so just quickly, the Tisa said to me, she said, I found myself through this memorial and she didn't previously identify as a descendant, but through the process, she got to know descendants, she sort of traced her ancestry and then she found herself as part of this community. So um, she said, I, I found my own identity, you know, through this process, this is really powerful. Yeah, I have to echo what Meijin and Eric um, said about the sense of ownership that the community members have exhibited over the memorial. Um, in contrast to what they did not necessarily have before. I mean, there was certainly the Daughters of Zion Cemetery, but even they discovered through ground penetrating radar that many of the um, folks who are buried there don't have markers. So this idea that there's now a very large and prominent um, space for remembrance in, in lots of different ways, I think has been really important. Um, one, one anecdote that I picked up in a conversation with some folks, um, some members of the descendant community was that, you know, there were a lot of ephemeral markers around the area. Like if you ever saw a grove of periwinkle or different types of flowers that might suggest that that's an area where um, folks' ancestors were buried, but the fact that now they have um, a, a site 
it's internationally recognized as a place for remembrance, but also honoring their ancestors, I think is a really important gesture. Eto, following on that, I think maybe people don't know, but early in our design process, almost all the early ideas were very ephemeral, mm -hmm. um, like planting on the lawn crocuses that would bloom every year. Um, and what we heard was there needed to be a physical place and space for them as a community. Yeah, that's powerful and it, it makes sense. Um, I have another question um, and this one is on collaboration. Among yourselves and other team members, how did that work practically and conceptually? So a little bit more on your how your collaborative process worked. Mabel, Eto, you guys should answer that one. <laughs> We're seeing it in action. <laughs> <laughs> Mabel, would you like to go first? Okay, um, I guess I, I could speak um, from my perspective, uh, being an artist who was invited to the uh, project, um, I, I wouldn't say midway in design, but um, af after a lot of uh, significant design and research was, uh, was done, um, it, for me, it was really interesting. A really dynamic team, um, folks like Greg Bleem and Frank and Mabel, and Eric, of course, and Mijin, um, all you know, introducing different perspectives and paying attention to different details um, was really inspiring. And I think everyone was really pushing each other to see just how far we could we can take this um, project to in, in a space that was unknown. The outcome was really unknown to many of us where, where we'd arrive at. Um, but I think that um, by sort of sharing our different processes and, and the way we look at things um, was what really helped generate a synergy. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would thank Nijin and Eric for really establishing an environment um, and kind of maybe an ethos of collaboration. Like, you know, we'll look at some, but you can't say, oh, so-and-so, like it's, you know, it really is like we all sort of designed collectively um you know and with input from you know from the community but you know as we mentioned there were just amazing um people you know we had a great office of the architect at uva alice rauscher uh, mary hugh sarita Herman. i mean just this list of phenomenal people you know who were there contributing and advising and sharing along the way and so you know, it really kind of felt like it took a village. Like we're like we're just skimming like all of it, and then all of the people that then work with us. You know, for, you know, from our very respective dis you know disciplines and practices and so forth. And you know, but I think we all understood the stakes of the project, and and you know, and I'm sure Cora thought the same thing with their teams and Team Henry and their like we all understood that that we were we were participating in something really important and meaningful, and not just for this place in this moment, but maybe something that could be useful for an entire nation sort of grappling, you know, with a, with, a, with its own difficult history. And um, I don't know, we, we, I think we all just really felt committed. And so it was, yeah, it, it was an extraordinary process. I miss you all. <laughs> so I wanna, that, that sounds so wonderful and magical. And also I'm imagining from the perspective of a young student watching this, like a, a, a complete thing that you could, would be very hard to imagine yourself into. So I have, an, I have a labor question, but then I wanna come back to a question from the perspective of a student. You know, how does, this was, project was started by students. They, they, they led the charge early on. So I want us to think about that. But first, a question about labor. And this question comes with a bit of a preamble about how some of you are, well known for thinking about labor in various ways and for building your work and your practice around um, fabrication um, and thinking about labor. So the question is, how did question is, questions of construction labor enter into the design and building of the memorial? Um, did the fact that the memorial acknowledges uncompensated forced labor affect decisions you made about the labor 
physically creating the more memorial um and um how were they how were the people who um who did the labor compensated or acknowledged i don't think that's literally how were they paid but how are they acknowledged how did your work in other words and your thinking about um labor manifest in, in this project but um I thought I saw a question in the chat from Jonathan Massey talking a little yep. bit about Mabel's. That's, um, that's what of, I'm riffing on, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the word labor is in the, is in the name um, and labor is what um, the enslaved were, were, were enslaved for, you know, in a way la their labor was what was being robbed. Um, and so um, we did sort of wonder about, you know, those laborers and, and these laborers. Um, certainly they're laboring under different conditions. Um, and certainly, you know, the reference to robotic fabrication is, is one, of, one of the sort of hallmarks of this moment. Um, the kind of stone carving would have been difficult to do by hand, but there's a lot of discussion in, in, in our picture about digital craft and, and questions of um, computation and so on, which, you know, I think it's interesting to to work with a super basic material like stone and a, and a memorial, but to use a kind of state-of-the-art sort of technique for, for carving and, and forming. Um, that said, um, construction is incredibly arduous, no matter how many robots are involved. If the precision of setting a piece of stone is not assisted by robots, you know, it's, it's maybe guided by digital surveying equipment, which is coordinated with the 3D model, but still backbreaking work um, and the people that assembled it were incredible craftspeople. So um, it's interesting to ask, you know, what is labor then and what is labor now? And I think, you know, Mabel's group, and she can talk about this, asking who builds your buildings is an important question for any architect to think about, you know, is, is, it, is it union labor? Is it, you know, fair wage labor? Is it under what conditions? Is it dangerous? What's the compensation? Um, but I'd like to think about not just those questions, but also questions of craft, um, you know, because we think about craft as, as thinking while doing, you know, and if you do it over and over, you're sort of thinking while you're doing it, you're sort of developing techniques and you're, you're doing it better and maybe recommending different ways to do things. So as designers, we try not to separate the questions of implementation from the questions of intent. We try to think about design intent through into fabrication, into construction. And I think that's how we become better designers because we have in mind the craft and the, the art of, 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 the, of the work, of the physical material work. Uh, that's my answer, but I'll let Mabel talk about other questions of labor, which I think are also you know, quite fascinating. I mean, the only thing I, I I would add, you know, with what Eric said was like, there's a, you know, photographs of like Eto in, in Eric and Cora's stone yard, you know, basically hammering. I mean, trying to understand like what, what is the force of like literally the arm on the tool onto the material itself. And, you know, the haptic quality of that exterior is supposed to kind of be you know, the, the, the grooves, the bush hammering pattern, you know, of a kind of residue of the unseen labor of the enslaved around the university. And it's there, it's in the serpentine walls, it's, you know, in the stair and that, but, but it just had not been understood in that way. And one of the quotes that, you know, we heard from, from, you know, one of the, one of the kind of community forums, was that they felt great pride when they looked at the columns in the university to know that perhaps one of their descendant had built that and and you know kind of recognizing you know that aspect of the material thing was very important i think for us early on in the project thank you um let's go back to the activists and maybe they're students and maybe they're not but but um what what advice do you have um, for students who want to make an impact through activism and creative practice? Um, maybe on a smaller scale. It's a big question, but it's um, it's especially for the students who are with us. It's worth taking on. Anybody want to jump into that? This is, in a way, we've said this multiple times. 
this is a thing that was made by students in a class who said the university needs this? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, we, I was looking at the student competition entries recently as I was going through some of the older slides uh, of the project and the students really mobilized to lift this and enable it uh, to happen. And um, I, I feel like their voices were fearless. Um, and, but the challenge with students is they graduate. So, you know, Ishraga had graduated by the time uh, our team uh, was brought on to design the memorial. And so, the kind of momentum that you need to sustain a project to get from the idea and then to build um, consensus around the idea and then to implement is sometimes long. Uh, and I guess that's my, my one bit of advice is you have to have patience and um, uh, fortitude and uh, and I think you need the right people in the conversation. I also think like as a discipline, we have a reputation for um, thinking of, about community engagement as really about uh, persuasion. Like where the architect or the planner or whoever, someone is presenting to a community to uh, convince the community that X is good or Y is good. And I think what you're seeing is, um, different approaches now where uh, it's not about persuasion, but about dialogue. Mm -hmm. And then how to um, harness that dialogue and synthesize it so it's not about executing a consensus or collage of all of the ideas presented, but synthesizing the ens essence of what is needed, demanded, desired uh, of a collective um, group that has many different perspectives, right? And that was our task. And I think that's the task of artists and the artist activists uh, today. Yeah, I mean, I, I think change takes a long time. And, and sometimes it seems like, oh, those Confederate monuments came down overnight, but actually, no, <laughs> they've been lawsuits. There have been there have been people working. There are always people working on the inside, and then there's radical action, oftentimes on the outside. And there's a kind of combination of multiple strategies. Like my sense, you know, kind of working on various kinds of advocacy projects is you just have to put pressure points on many things, and it's that collective pressure that will then sort of push for change. Um, but institutions, as you know, we know, like like universities being a per, they're they're often slow to change, right? And so you have to sort of keep at it again and again. And sometimes, you know, as Mijin said, it's you know it may not be within four years. It it may take eight years, or it may take ten years. And this, you know, this memorial, yeah, I mean, it 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 took twelve years. I mean, it, it from the beginnings to you know now. Uh, and it's still an ongoing process that I hope that students will engage in because I don't think the issues raised are resolved in any way. And that's actually a relatively short time frame for a lot of memorials to 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 be built. They usually take a long time. But I think that's I think that's really great advice for students that it is a long game and that um, and that 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 really understanding the engagement piece. Um, that where you start in your activism might not be where you end up once you really engage with a community. I think that's I also think the additive elements aggregate, right? So as Mabel was saying, like the many, many different pressure points that make something large happen. Um, but I also think that um, there are uh, things that don't need to take 10 years and don't need to engage uh, such an extensive uh, process. And um, the proliferation of uh, these kind of interventions in our public spaces and public spheres, they can be, they can be ephemeral and still very, very powerful.
Yeah. Uh, um, impatience of youth maybe doesn't have the, the, if the ephemeral, <laughs> just imagining the students that I'm, that I work with, but I, I, I think that's a really important point. I have another question, which is about, um, are people interacting with the memorial in ways that you didn't anticipate? The question says, Eto described the, the memorial as a series of experience, experiences. Uh, Eric described the way that looking at the memorial can shape the viewer's body, move the viewer's body. Um, are people interacting it with, with it in ways that you didn't anticipate? And maybe this is covered a little bit, but maybe there's more to be said on this. For me, there's one that I didn't anticipate. So I don't know about um, Eric, Mabel, Eto, but I was surprised that, and I don't know if it was because of the white coats for black lives and the commemoration uh, and memorialization uh, of George Floyd, uh, the remembrance that happened there. But in my mind, when we designed the memorial, that center circle of grass was not sacred, that it was a space that students would hang out and, you know, people would sit in, on the lawn and, you know, have conversations there. Um, but I think somehow in the memorial it feels more sacred now than I, I thought it would and I don't know if just over time it will be more comfortable uh, comfortably used uh, by the public was one and then um, you had asked like if there um, you know if there was something um, that I think didn't um, didn't um, go yeah. as planned, go as planned. And one of them was, you know, the plan was to plant a grove of trees. And the idea was there'd be a lot of shade on that lawn. And then the memorial would be um, a kind of hollow. Uh, and Mabel referred to it like a hush harbor. Um, but you know, we, we had even staked out where all the trees would be after the memorial was way underway in construction. And members of the community really didn't want the trees to be planted. They wanted it to remain open. They were worried that the trees would hide the memorial. Um, and also the reference of trees and lynchings and what that could represent. Uh, so, I think both of those things were surprises to us in the process. I have another question, which is very much related and which you have partially answered, but it's a question about um, the future of the memorial, the way in which it is a living landscape. Are there changes that you anticipate beyond the addition of more names? Um, did you think about the future sort of a long arc of the life of the memorial as you were designing that might include more new elements? We didn't talk much about the landscape elements because um, Greg uh, isn't on this call. Um, but I would share that from the beginning of our process, I think everybody took on everyone else's role. <laughs> so um, everyone was a designer, everyone was the artist, everyone was the landscape architect, I think on our team. And um, one of the things Greg introduced was this planting of the uh, crocuses in the center. And I think that came out of conversation with you, Mabel, and um, the uh, museum uh, on the Washington Mall. And so that will happen seasonally. And I think the other acknowledgement that we had as a team was that this was just the first um, step and that it's, you know, on this step, like right, right before you get uh, to the academical village. But there are, you know, the university itself um, the buildings and the landscape are a memorial to the enslaved laborers 
um, much more fully. And um, I think we'll see more recognition of that as time goes on. And there are uh, additional plans, I think, underway by the university. I think one of the concrete sort of next steps is the, the idea of a learning center. Um, you know, right now it's a memorial, but to access information history, you would need to sort of go online, go to the library, go to the archive. And there was a plan of a kind of interpretive center, something where there would be more artifacts. Right now, if you went into the rotunda, there's actually some displays. Some of the bricks with the fingerprints in them are, are sort of housed there. Um, but I, I'm just thinking about like other memorial landscapes, like the one in Berlin, uh, which incorporates the kind of learning center. And I think that was a very deliberate choice to say, this abstract landscape can't possibly encompass all the questions that people would have. And so I believe the, the lawmakers insisted that there be a learning center sort of coupled with the memorial. So abstraction complemented with um, information. And I think the Vietnam Memorial tells us lessons about, you know, action coupled with representation, coupled with learning, you know, and so the kind of accumulation of these elements to sort of add up to something uh, that could start to engage with those histories. So I think concrete next steps, I think there is discussion about a future learning center, interpretive center, more exhibition, more content, more access. Also the digital site that Mabel's working on and um, the work of the historians that I think is really critical to the next set of uh, knowledge shared. Yeah, there, there is still ongoing work um, by the historians. There's a really great um, book by Lewis Nelson and Maury McGinnis called Educated in Tyranny um, that gathers together several scholars um, who've spent years kind of working on this question, a number of years working on this question. Uh, and that's still ongoing research. You know, again, I mean, it's like there are descendants that are <laughs> emerging and they have histories and stories to then add um, to this kind of puzzle um, of, the, of the university. And so, you know, there's a whole educational component. The education school has been involved in developing, you know, K through 12 curriculum on how to sort of teach this history and the role that the monument will play. And so it's ongoing. And because, you know, UVA took a lead, you know, Brown had done very important work, UNC, um, Chapel Hill had built a more, I mean, there had been memorial projects, Princeton did a, a sculpture um, by Titus Kafir, but, you know, the university really sort of took on this kind of larger project and established university studying slavery, a kind of consortium, you know, that included William first, William and Mary and UVA and, you know, these kind of Virginia, Georgetown would join and, you know, my university, Columbia University, you know, has a history of slavery, as does Harvard. I mean, these universities all have these histories. And so now they're starting to make these efforts to understand those early histories because slavery is not, you know, gone with the wind in this plantation in Louisiana. You know, it was an essential kind of part of the emerging mercantile and industrial economy of a colonialized world. And, you know, so it was everywhere. And these, you know, these institutions were, you know, complicit and a part of that, that, that system of both trade and profit. Well, that's a powerful and um, last comment and, a, and I think a powerful place for us to end. I'll just say, before I say thank you, I will say, you know, one of the things that I think you have contributed for people who don't live in Charlottesville and haven't been working on this memorial, Charlottesville as a noun has come to mean something that's so, so um, in uh, that is the antithesis of the work that you have done. And, you know, in the spirit of the long game, I think for those of us outside the world of Charlottesville, you are offering, you're changing what the noun means. And, and for that, we're really grateful. So thank you. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you to the panelists, especially Eto. I think you were having some connectivity issues. So we're really grateful that you've stuck it out. And it was lovely to spend some time with you today. Thank you. And thank you to the Institute.